when they were there, of course, all these guys were chewing tobacco, and I thought that was so cool. <laughs> and, I, and you know, they would take a plug and spit out, you know, and go, wow, oh, so cool. So one day, Joe McRae comes, and he hands me this little bar. What it was, it was a, a licorice bar. And so you take a chunk out of that, chew that, when you spit that out, it looks just like good old tobacco out there, right? <laughs> and so I felt like one of the guys. Uh -huh. there, okay. Hi, I'm Rob Ward. Welcome to Award on Western Fair. We talk about the genre that we love. Do we love it? Yes. That would be Westerns. And we're going to have somebody as a guest right now who you know from a sci-fi classic, Invaders from Mars. That was a scary movie. Well, he made some great westerns with one of our heroes, Joel McRae, and I'm talking about little Jimmy Hunt. Little Jimmy. Oh, come on in, Jimmy. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. How, How are you? How, How are you, pal? Good. Have a seat. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Me too. Me too. Well, it's always good to be anywhere, I think, That's these days. It already is, yes. I know that you hadn't made a film in quite some time, but the ones that you made were special. And we're Thank gonna you. talk a little bit about Invaders from Mars later, but you did a couple films with Joel McRae and one of them, The, the Lone Hand. It's all told from your viewpoint. Right, that was the first movie I ever narrated, yeah. Like Shane, where we see this gunfighter come in from the kid's point of view, and the relationship you had with Joel was special. It was, yeah. No, he was, uh, of all of the uh, people that I worked with, and uh, you know, after you make 42 movies, you know, you, you look and you go, yeah, I worked with a lot of great stars, you know, and uh, Joel McRae was, had to be my favorite. You know, there was a couple people that I didn't get to work with, Patrick's dad, but, uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, Joel was, was my favorite. He was like a dad to me. Well, he, he played your dad in the show, but he right. was, he had secrets. And you had secrets too in that film. And it gave a little bit of tension to your relationship. What was he like offset? Well, he was, like I said, he was like a second dad. I mean, I had the best dad in the whole world. There wasn't a dad that could be any better than my father was. But we were gone uh, like almost two months in Colorado filming Lone Hand. And uh, so it was just myself and my mom. And uh, Joel kind of just filled in and became a, a father figure. And he treated me just like his son. And some of the things that he did that were so great, and I still remember, was the fact that in the morning, uh, we got ready to shoot. Uh, the Wranglers would bring in all the horses and stuff. and and get them ready for the, for the day. And when they were there, of course, all these guys were chewing tobacco and I thought that was so cool. Right? <laughs> and you know, they would take a plug and spit out, you know, and go, wow, oh, so cool. So one day, Joe McRae comes and he hands me this little bar. What it was, it was a, a licorice bar. And so you take a chunk out of that, chew that, when you spit that out, it looks just like good old tobacco out there, right? <laughs> and so I felt like one of the guys. Uh -huh. okay. Did yeah. you ever swallow any? Oh, the licorice, yes, yeah. but no. <laughs> I never swallowed the other stuff. <laughs> well, with the wrangling, because he was such a beautiful vision on a horse, oh. did you ride often with him? When I first started, they, you know, they're getting prepared to make the movie. They took me out on the back lot of, of Universal Studios. And uh, I got to ride, you know, drive a team of horses. And that was great. I loved doing that. And then, of course, they, got, uh, they had this uh, horse that they had got that belonged to this little girl. And she was the only one that had ridden that horse. They said, well, if she can ride it, I mean, you know, any kid can do that, right? So they take me and they put me on the horse. And the wrangler said, hey, just take him out here for a little run and bring him back. Well, I, you know really never ridden a horse very often. You know, I mean, I think I came down to Griffith Park and rode the ponies, you know, but that was a, and so I get on the horse and out we go and all of a sudden that little horse finds out that I'm not the little girl <laughs> and he doesn't want anything to do with me. And he tries and he tries and he bucks me off. And I land up, you know, on the side of this little hill and, and now the horse takes off and runs back to the stables and now I'm out there, you know, 
kind of half crying to myself saying, well, you know, why did I get this? And so I came back and they're saying, well, no, no, that horse is going to be okay. And on the way back uh, to, to make the film in, in Colorado, they shipped the horse back and the horse got in a fight with another horse and got beat up pretty badly. And so they couldn't use him. Mm. And I was the happiest kid in the whole <laughs> world. <laughs> so I got a horse that liked me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you had never ridden before that then. Uh, no, not really. Mm -hmm. You know, I always wanted wanted a little horse, but I can you now. It's unusual that they would have sent you out by yourself then, the Wranglers. Hey, they, they, <laughs> they were probably laughing at the stable, you know, going, yeah, we sent the kid out, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't the first Joel McRae film that you did, but that one, like I said, your part was more special and playing your the mother, because Joel marries her, is Barbara Hale. Right. And she was married to Bill Williams, who was Kit Carson on TV. And later she, of course, became Della Street. But she did some great westerns with uh, Bob Mitchum at RKO, too. What a great lady she was. Um, she, uh, she was just a, a really special. And she and Williams, uh, they were there, of course, you know, on the, on the, uh, up in Colorado. And, and one night, my mom and, the, and the, the school teacher that was always along with you, uh, they decided they were going to go into Durango, Colorado, the, the big town. And uh, so someone had to babysit me. And so it was Barbara Hale and her husband. And so that was kind of a neat mm -hmm. deal. And then later on, um, she came to do a, a guest appearance at, a, at an autograph show. And she was there, and they had this a line that was went you know out the building and to people to see her, and and I happened to see her, and I had a picture of her in one of my scrapbooks. So I got it, and I walked over, and I broke into the line and said, "Hey, mom, would you sign this for me?" <laughs> and she, hey, it was so good. I mean, yeah, you know, and everybody, I got a little bit of applause for that, you know. But yeah, she was so good to me. Yeah. You grew up in, in L.A., right. so how did you get into movies at such a young age? Uh, right place, right time. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to school about six blocks from uh, MGM Studio at a grammar school there, La Bayona Grammar School. And uh, they needed somebody to play the part of Van Johnson as a young boy and for a movie called High Barbary. And they looked through Hollywood and couldn't find anybody. And uh, so they came out to the local schools and uh, they picked myself and a few other kids and we went and had the screen test. And um, somehow my curly hair and my freckles, I got the part. <laughs> I, had, I had, my family had nothing to do with show business. We didn't know anything about it. We were just a typical middle-class family that, you know, that lived in the, near the Culver City area. And that, that was, uh, that's how it all started. How old were you then? I was almost seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I can see the resemblance with Ben Johnson, too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it worked out. Yeah, it worked you out. also did Pitfall, uh, a wonderful film noir that Andre de Toth directed with Dick Powell, who plays your dad. Right. And your mom is Jane Wyatt. Jane Wyatt, yeah. And, you know, of course, Dick Powell has some fling with uh, Elizabeth Scott. Right. And you're naughty or something. You're anxious and your mother says, it's got to be the comic books. And so she takes all your comic books in the movie and she burns them. You know, that's evil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and yeah, I remember uh, he came in and was reading a book to me in, in, the, in the movie. And it was the, uh, the Busby Boys and I don't know, in the mountains or something. I, you know, I'm, I'm there thinking, who in the heck are these guys, you know? Or the Hardy Boys, I don't know, mm. remember. Whatever, but yeah, that was one of the, he was a, he, I mean, I enjoyed making that movie. You know, it was uh, probably about maybe the eighth, ninth movie I'd made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it holds up. That's really one of the, the, the best. And he later became a big producer, director. And it was kind of funny because as a child, you know, I never really realized how famous these people were that I was playing with, you know? I mean, my parents had to explain who they were, you know, like who Bing Crosby was, who 
Uh, well, I knew that because he did, you know, White Christmas and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, Dick Powell, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I never knew he danced and did all those kind of <laughs> things, you know. Well, you did also a Western that nobody has heard of. I mean, I, as I was digging through your resume, I went, wow, John Sturgis directed this Western noir with Lou Ayers and Teresa Wright and Jimmy is in it called The Capture. Yeah. Written by Nevin Bush. Right, yep. That was, uh, that was a fun movie. That was the first time I think I'd ever gone on, on location to make a, a film. And we went to uh, Joshua Tree. Mm -hmm. And you talk about being, I mean, at that time, that was, you could have gone to the moon. It's how far away it was. And uh, yeah, we spent uh, like a, a week out there. Mm -hmm. And I think I felt sorry. And now I feel sorry. It was, it was a fun movie. I got to, uh, got to go with uh, Teresa Wright and Niven Bush to their home. And uh, I mean, they, I was fortunate. Everybody and every movie I ever made, they always treated me well. And I don't know, maybe because I was just this naive young kid that had no idea what the movies were all about. <laughs> I mean, I took my little lunch pail and I went to work. And I got to the set and the, the, you know, the director would tell me what he wanted me to do. I tried to do what he wanted. And then, you know, that's how it went. So I, I wasn't, I really wasn't, we weren't really into, my, my parents and, and my whole family wasn't into the movie thing. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was just something that if you could keep doing it and, you know, you'd make a little bit of money here that we could put that in a college fund for you. And... Well, you mentioned uh, the, the teacher that had been on location with you in Colorado. Did you feel slighted in terms of what you learned in school or not in school? You miss your friends a little bit, but uh, no, I mean, I, I now realize, you know, it was kind of like a, I had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a teacher. I mean, you know, if I had a question and I wasn't afraid to ask because there was none of your peers around. So when you asked the question, nobody was going to make fun of you. So you just, you know, I don't understand what, what's this about. And, and so they don't know. It was like I had, you know, I had a tutor and it was really good. Mm -hmm. And then I would, after each movie was over, I'd go back to school. And the kids, did they treat you differently? Oh, I don't think really. Uh, no, I had some pretty good buddies and we were, you know, it was pretty good. Uh, no, they didn't treat me any different. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Republic Studios, they were doing some big budgeted westerns for them in addition to the, the B-Western, The Singing Cowboys, and you were in one of their big budget films that Joseph Kane directed, and it was Forrest Tucker's first starring Western, Rock Island Trail, with Adele Maurer, too, and Lorna Gray, and Grant Withers, and Chill Wills. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I played the part of a, a young kid that, uh, you know, kind of was grew up on the, on the, on the river, you know, there, and uh, was out fishing, and... And I think it was, uh, I guess he played the part of Abe Lincoln. I don't know. I'm not sure who, who the character was, but, uh, you know, I had to tell Jeff him about. Jeff Corey. Jeff Corey played Abe Lincoln. Okay. All right. I had to tell him about the currents because this, I guess it was a, a paddle wheel ship had, you know, crashed and burned. And so. Yeah. It was about building the bridge across, the first bridge across the Mississippi River. A true story. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it was set in the 1880s, yeah, I think, too. Yeah, a little yeah, bit okay. my time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Another 1880s movie yeah. was your first with Joel McRae, which was Saddle Tramp. How were you cast in that film? You were part of a group of orphans that Joel takes control of and hides them as he goes to work on the ranch of John McIntyre and Jeanette Nolan. Right. Um... And then Wanda Hendricks was in that uh, too. Well, who was married yeah. to Audie Murphy at the time. Yeah. Did he ever come yes, on he location? Did. Yes, I, he did. And I got to meet him. What was that like? Um, at, for, as a little kid, you know, growing up during World War II, uh, you know, he was a hero. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a kid, we did, uh, as soon as the war was over, I remember we used to take, you know, every... Saturday, we'd go down to the, uh, the old uh, surplus stores and pick up all the army equipment we could get. I mean, 
And I remember nowadays, you know, you'd be put in jail for what we did, but we ran, we had, a, we actually, one of the fathers, the kid's father brought back a, a 30 caliber machine gun. <laughs> and so we had this, and it had none of the, none of the inner workings, but we had this machine gun. It took two of us to carry that thing, you know, and, and uh, we would dig foxholes and fill up uh, old Coke bottles with, with dirt and throw them <laughs> like hand grenades. And, and we had the helmets and I mean, the whole, the whole thing. And we had, I had a jungle knife that I ran around with all the time. And this thing was, you know, totally mm -hmm. big, huge. <laughs> and nowadays, I mean, you know, the cops would take you and put you in jail for that, you know, but no, we ran around like that, you know, and you'd leave in the morning and come back when the, when the lights went off, mm -hmm. you know, or on, the, yeah. Well, those were different days, weren't they? They were, they were good days. So with the Saddle Tramp, how were you cast in that film? Uh, there was the four of us boys and, uh, you know, Gordon Gebert and Orly, uh, Orly, and I can't remember, oh, Moffat and myself. Yeah, we were, you know, and, we, and Joel took us and kind of hit us out. And, and that was, that was a fun, that was a fun movie too. Now, do you think that that role helped get you the one in the lone hand? It could have, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it probably could have, yeah. Mm -hmm. If it did, I'm happy for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. because that, that Lone Hand was my favorite movie. Well, it's easy to see why. Now, you mentioned seeing Barbara Hale later uh, at an yeah. autograph show. Did you ever run into Joel McRae? I talked to Joel McRae in 1986. Uh, that was the last time I talked to him. And we had talked about, you know, his ranch there in, in uh, the Moore Park uh, area there. And it's about... 20 minutes from where I live right now. And, uh, and his grandson, Wyatt mm -hmm. McRae, uh, and his wife, we've, we've become friends. And, um, but uh, yeah, so J Joel was uh, just something special about mm -hmm. him. You know, he was just a good guy. What do you think it was about the 50s that made Westerns such a dominant genre? It's the moral standing of the United States at that time, which we've lost. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was the good guys and the bad guys, mm -hmm. okay? Easy to tell them apart. Oh, right, you know? And, uh, and it was something that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't bad to mm -hmm. be good, mm -hmm. you know? And, 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 uh, and, and people stood up for what was right. And so they, and that was what Westerns were all about. Yeah. And maybe that's why a certain group of audience, uh, an aging audience, were, were going back because we find comfort in the good guys winning and seeing the good versus the bad and good wins. Right. And it always will. Well, except for Yellowstone. It's so confusing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it, yeah, I know. I, I think, you know, and, and we, as kids, we grew up with that. I mean, I remember as a kid, what did you do? You played cowboys and Indians, and you played army, and, uh, and, you, and you, re, re, you lived the roles. I mean, you know, I mean, I remember I had my two six guns, yeah. and yeah. I, I, I kept all mine, I still have mine. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when Robbie was a kid, and the parents at the elementary school were concerned he's not going to have his toy guns out is he the, our our children are not allowed to play with this <laughs> and they look real i mean the the fanner 50s and the stallion 45s from Nichols, those oh, were great guns metal that was the one thing that um, as a child uh, that if you ever played in a movie where there was any kind of weapons around as soon as the scene was over the prop man would come in, take those things and lock them up. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you never had a chance. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I did the remake of Invaders from Mars, I played the part of the, uh, the chief of police. And so I have a gun. And so I talked to the prop man. I said, listen, please, when the scene is over, just let me keep it. I said, the thing is plugged. It, it can't hurt anybody, <laughs> you know? And, and, and so I had, that was, part, that was the best part of that whole movie. 
me getting to play with that gun. Yeah. Uh, reliving your youth from that 1953 classic, and it is a classic, are you surprised now at the reaction that that film still gets? Yes, I am. I am. I, like I said, I always thought that it was a good movie, and I always thought that, uh, but I always thought that, you know, like, Lone Hand was better, mm -hmm. and, and some of the other movies I had made, uh, you know, Cheaper by the Dozen and Numbers, but but it has lived on, and, and it, there's a legacy right now. I mean, it is, it's it's mm -hmm. coming back. I mean, mm -hmm. and, I, and there's a lot of, I mean, I've met in the last, oh, since they, uh, they did the uh, re restoration of the film, I found out that, you know, there's this whole new fan base. And it's, and it's amazing. I mean, you know, there's some, I always thought that, you know, as soon as the fan, the original fan base died off, and believe me, they died off too. Um, <laughs> it's happening with Westerns too. So. And, you, know, and, you know, it's like, I, I remember my first autograph show I went to, I had numerous times people would ask me to come and do them. And I said, no, I don't do that. I'm out of the show business. I don't do that. And so finally this one gentleman convinced me to come back to New York and do it. So we go back and I took my youngest son along with me and we get there and uh, we're at this Holiday Inn and uh, we come in and there's this group of older people on the other side of the lobby. Your young fans. <laughs> standing over there, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden somebody goes, that's him, that's him. And, and, and I looked at my son and all of a sudden here they come, right? With their walkers. <laughs> 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 and, and I, you know, it, it was kind of frightening at first, you know, I, I, you know, and they wanted my autograph. And then as we're going up the elevator with my son looks over and he goes, see, Dad, I told you, your fan base hasn't died out yet. You know? <laughs> but it was, yeah, that was pretty funny. But you're right, there are new ones coming up. And, you know, why is that movie still as scary? You know, it, uh, the, the parents turn into zombies and it was, it predated Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which has a very similar theme. Right. No, it, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, I can't say anything bad about that movie anymore. <laughs> I mean, hey, it's, well, the look of it, William Cameron Menzies, one of the uh, great set designers uh, in film history, directed that, and he didn't direct very many films. What was he like? I never realized how, how great he was. Mm -hmm. And I can remember some of the things that happened uh, Prior to making the movie, we got there and and they wanted me to uh, meet the giant guy, the mutants, the big guys. And you know they didn't want me to be frightened or anything. And so these guys came in with their outfits on, and then uh, they, they took them off, and I got to meet them. And you know they were, well, they were two of the largest people I'd ever seen. <laughs> One guy was, uh, I, I say he was eight foot tall. He was. Uh, they, they said he's anywhere from seven eight to eight foot. And then Lock Martin was. I think he was, they said he was seven, nine, but he had to wear lifts so that he could be the same height as the other guy. I said, it's the first time in his life he ever had to wear lifts. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, so I got to meet them and, and then while I was there, there was this room, a very large room, and it had all of uh, this artwork of, uh, that Menzies had done. The storyboard. The storyboard, the whole thing, all the way around. And there was the whole picture right there. And he was gonna go right, you know. And a day before we started production, it was all stolen. Did, and no, no one knows where it ever went. Still. Still, that I know of. And I've talked to some people that are real experts on the film and no, they don't know. And so he had to go by memory and some notes that he had made, but and the one thing I can say about him was the fact that he was very methodical and he knew what he wanted. And, you know, you didn't, if he saw that he got that in that first take, that was it. We didn't have to keep burning film, as they said in the old days, you know. No, it just, uh, you got it and you printed it and it was off. Well, it's a wonderful film and you have shown us wonderful memories of, of films that we love. Uh, th that one, I remember seeing that. I didn't see it on first release, but on a triple feature, 
And it was scary, Invaders from Mars, and it still is. And that's why you have a new generation of fans. They don't have their walkers. They've got, they're in strollers, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and they're, and they're, all, they're all afraid to go to the beach because of, <laughs> because of the sand. They don't want to get pulled down. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And the little guy in the globe, the globe. Was great stuff. That was a, I'll have to, just a little story on that. Uh, it, the lady that, di- it's a lady that did that. It was, uh, and... Uh, she was a, a midget lady, or a, a small person, as they call them now. And uh, she, uh, my mom walked in on the set, and she said, oh my gosh, that's Midge Potter. And it, she went to high school with her. Ah. And so, yeah, she did their little thing, sitting under, a, you know, in a in kind of a cardboard box with, with this globe over and doing <laughs> that stuff with her eyes. Yeah. And yeah. she was in uh, Wizard of Oz, too, wasn't she? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Well, the whole group, yeah. yeah. Billy yeah. Curtis and everybody else, yeah. Well, how fun. Well, thank you for joining us today, Jimmy. Thank and you sharing very much. These wonderful uh, yeah, memories. No, I really appreciate, I appreciate that. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming, pal. Thank you, Ralph. All right. Okay. Thank you so All much. Right. Okay.